Okay, in this video, we're going to go through section 4.7, which is on optimization problems. Now, in the previous video, I, I did a preview of optimization problems to lay some groundwork before we, we got into this section of the textbook. So if you need, go check that out first. It's the video just before this in the calculus playlist, but I'll also post a link in the description. Okay, the methods we have learned in this chapter for finding extreme values have practical applications in many areas of life. A business person wants to minimize costs and maximize profits. A traveler wants to minimize transportation time. Fermat's principle in optics states that light follows the path that takes the least time. In this section, we solve such problems as maximizing areas, volumes, and profits, and minimizing distances, times, and costs. So that's the idea of an optimization problem. There's something you're trying to optimize. You're trying to find the optimum value of something. So what does that mean, the optimum value? Well, like it says, the, the least amount of time, the maximum profit, the maximum area, the minimum distance, cost. Okay, and so what topics that we've learned in calculus so far are going to be associated with optimization problems? Like it says here, it's going to be extreme values. So finding the maximum and minimum values of a function over some interval. And what we've learned about finding maximum and minimum values is they're, they're associated with critical points. That, that's where extreme values come from, critical points, with respect to the first derivative, to be specific, where the first derivative is equal to zero or doesn't exist. Extreme values. Okay, so to solve optimization problems in calculus, the main skill you need is finding extreme values of a function over an interval in, in, in specifically finding the absolute max or absolute min value of a function over an interval. In solving such practical problems, the greatest challenge is often to convert the word problem into a mathematical optimization problem by setting up the function that is to be maximized or minimized. So yeah, this is, this is the other part of an optimization problem. You, you, you need to be, so, so one, one aspect of solving an optimization problem is finding the absolute max and min over an interval. The other aspect that you need to be able to do is going from you converting the word problem into the mathematical optimization problem. So to find the absolute max and min or, or min value of a function over an interval, what we've done so far in calculus is we're, we're given the function, given the interval, and then we, and then we do our analysis. Well, with optimization problems, we, the, we're just given a word problem. We aren't given the function. We aren't given the interval to start. We have the, 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 you have to read the problem and find what that get the correct function in the correct in the correct interval. That's part of the problem. Then you can find the extreme values. So it's it's like two it's like two things you need to be able to do to solve optimization problems. Find the correct function that you need to optimize and the corresponding domain or the interval, and then find the, the extreme value. Okay, and so here's the steps it lists for solving optimization problems. And just to summarize this, so you read the word problem carefully, understand the word problem. If applicable, draw a diagram. Some, maybe sometimes you, you won't need to draw a diagram, but if it's applicable, draw a diagram. And in the diagram, you show the, there's, okay, so when you read the problem, one of the, the main things to, when you, to understand about the problem is what is the variable that, that you're wanting to optimize? Is it time? Is it profit? What's being optimized? Okay, so then you draw the diagram or just, you know, any kind of just maybe not a diagram, but just you do like the analysis and that, that diagram would show the variable that's being optimized as well as any other variables. Okay, introduce notation. They, they call the variable to be optimized Q here. That's just a general variable they use. So yeah, so in, in the diagram, in the analysis, you, you identify the, the variable that needs to be optimized and, the, and any other associated variables. All right, step four, you express the variable that's going to be optimized in terms of one or more of the other variables, the other associated variables. Most likely, it's, it's, going, to, it's going to be at this step, you'll have Q as a function of more than one input variable. Okay, now... This is single variable calculus. We're, we're, the, we're, we're in single variable calculus. So we only have, have learned how to find extreme values, maximum and minimum values, for a function of a single variable. We'll learn about finding extreme values of a function with, with more than one variable in multivariable calculus. 
Okay, but th this is single variable calculus. So if you're working an optimization problem in single variable calculus, then once you have your Q as a function of more than one input variable, maybe it'll just be a function of a single variable, but typically it'll be a function of more than one input variable. Then you're going to go back to the word problem and there's going to be some information that's going to allow you to re find a way to relate the input variables to each other, some equations that relate the input variables to each other. And with those equations, then you can ex then express Q as a function of a single input variable, say Y, for example, or it could be X or Z. It'll be a Q as a function of just a single input variable. Okay. So then you've, so now you've got the variable to be optimized as a function of a single input variable, but you're not done finding the optimization function yet because the last step is to, you need to put the correct domain for the input variable the domain that you're analyzing. So it just depends on, we'll, we'll see some examples in a second. It just depends on the problem. If it can't be, if it makes no sense for that input variable to be negative, then that, then a negative numbers are outside of the domain. Okay. So you'll have the function to be optimized as a function of a single variable, the corresponding domain for that variable. Now at that point, you've got the function and the interval. The last step is to, to use the techniques that we've learned so far to find the absolute max and min. And I go into more specifics on exactly what we've learned to, to, for how to find those absolute maxes and mins. Check, uh, that, that's, what the, that's the main thing that the preview is about, the, uh, the previous video. Again, the link is in the description. All right, let's take a look at these examples to give you a sense of this. A farmer has 2,400 feet of fencing and wants to fence off a rectangular field that borders a straight river. He needs no fence along the river. What are the dimensions of the field that has the largest area? All right, so the, the first thing you're you're looking for here it, it, I, that I would say to look for is first identify what is the variable that you're trying to optimize. So you, you're trying to find what's the largest area, right? The maximum area. So we're optimizing the variable, the, the, the variable, the area, okay? So we'll call that, I guess, A. That's what we're, this is what we're trying to optimize. This is Q, all right? So now... The next thing you can do is, is you could draw a diagram if it's applicable. All right, so they have a river here, and they show a few different scenarios with like a, a shallow fenced-in area, more of a deep but not wide, and, and here's kind of in the middle. But the diagram you're going to draw, though, you, you can do this if you want for analysis, but you're going to draw a diagram that's more general. So you've got, the, here's with the border of the river, and you've got, two legs here and, and then the, the here's the connecting point these two are length x and this is length y that's just two random variables x and y this is the the i guess the depth of the area and this is the width okay so that's your diagram it shows there's the variable to be optimized and just here's some other variables that are just given arbitrary symbols x and y that are pertinent to the problem they're pertinent because the, the next step is you write an equation that relates the variable to be optimized to all of the other variables. A is equal to X times Y, right? That's step four here. Express Q in terms of the other symbols. A is equal to X times Y, all right? Now, the next step is you're going to go back to your, the word problem and because this is single variable calculus, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna eventually want to get to the, the variable to be optimized as a function of a single input variable. This is a function of two. So you know in single variable calculus, you can go back to the word problem, and there's going to be some information it gives you that allows you to relate the input variables. So if we come here, it says a farmer has 2,400 feet of fencing. Well, there you go. That's it. The perimeter, well, not, not the perimeter of the area because you don't count along the river. So like x plus x plus y, 2x plus y is equal to 2,400, the total length of fencing. So there you go. Now you can solve for x or y, substitute, and now you've got the area as a function of a single variable, all right? But you're not done. You're not, you're not done with the initial step of finding the function to be optimized because you have to put the domain. We've got to this point. We've got the variable to be optimized as a function of a single input variable. But you need to then say, okay, well, what's the domain of that input variable? That's important. You got to put the correct domain. Okay. So it says, note that the largest X can be is 1200 and X can't be negative. 
right? So why can X only be 1,200? Because you've got 2,400 feet of fencing. If X is 1,200, you've got, then you've got two X's, right? You'd have two fences side by side, and there'd be no depth. Two 1,200 feet long fences, and, no, and the Y would be zero, okay? So X can be as mo, at most 1,200, and it can't be negative. That doesn't make any sense. So now you've got the domain of the input variable. Now it's, it's just the, the, you're finding the extreme values. What is the absolute maximum and minimum value of that, or just the absolute max? We're just looking for the max. What is the absolute maximum value of a, the area, this area function, over this interval? Okay, and so, again, in the previous video, I go into details on everything we know about finding these absolute maxes and mins. In, in, in a lot of cases, you can just use the, the closed interval method because, like, for example, here, if you come back here, this function is continuous everywhere, and it's a closed interval from 0 to 1,200. It's defined at the endpoints. So if we come back here, the closed interval method, we know, closed endpoints, that there's an official math procedure that you can use to, to solve for the absolute maxes and mins. You, you evaluate the function at the endpoints, list those endpoint values, then you find the critical numbers with respect to the first derivative, and you evaluate the function at all the critical numbers, list those values off to the side, then compare all those values. The largest of all those values is the absolute max. The smallest is the absolute min. And so if we've got a closed interval, which a lot of these optimization problems will have, then it's, it's straightforward and easy. If it's not a closed interval for all any other cases, that's what I, I expand on that in the previous video and even videos before that. So you can, you know, you don't have to worry about coming across some sort of a domain or, or a, a problem, an optimization problem where you've got a, a, a domain that you don't know how to work with. Uh, we, I go through all scenarios that you could come across. Any kind of do weird domain with discontinuities, open endpoints, or maybe even going going off to infinity in one direction, let's say. How do you analyze something like this with an infinite endpoint for absolute maxes and mins? I talk about all that in the previous video and even videos before that. Example two, a cylindrical can is to be made to hold one liter of oil. Find the dimensions that will minimize the cost of the metal to manufacture the can. So, all right, they draw a, a cylinder here, just a rough a sketch of, of a can, and so to minimize the cost, the idea is we want to minimize the surface area, the total surface area. All right, so we'll call that the variable to be optimized is going to be A. This is surface area. And then they draw a diagram here with associated variables, so the radius of the, the ends and then the height. And so the next step is to express the variable to be optimized as a function of the input variables. So... What's the total surface area? Okay, well, 2 times pi r squared, the two ends, and then plus, this would be, so the circumference is 2 pi r, and then times h. There you go. So this is a as a function of r and h. Okay, next step is you go back to the original, pro the, the word problem, and there's going to be something in the word problem that's going to allow you to relate the input variables to each other so that you can make the, the variable to be optimized a function of a single variable. So coming back to the word problem, it says a cylindrical can can be made to hold one liter of oil. So there you go. This is going to hold one liter of oil. All right, what's the volume of this, of the, of the can? Well, that's pi r squared times h. So pi r squared times h is going to be equal to one liter, and they put that in cubic centimeters. There you go, 1,000. So with this, you can solve for r as a function of h, or h as a function of r, and then convert. So here they solve for h as a function of r, substitute in, and, con and now you've got the area as a function of a single input variable, r. Okay, but then you need to also put the domain of this, the correct domain. So what's the domain going to be? Well, r can be anything other than negative. Negative doesn't make any sense, but it could be it could go all the way to infinity. What, why? How could it be? How could R be a million, a million meters? I mean, obviously that that would be unrealistic, you know. But technically, it can because 
if R is a million, then H is going to be sufficiently small so, so that you still get pi R squared H is equal to 1,000. So R, here's the A sub R, and then R is greater than zero. So there you go. There's the function, the, 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 the variable to be optimized is a function of a single variable in the corresponding domain. So now you just need to find what's the, we're looking for the, the absolute minimum value of this over this interval. All right, now this is, this is not a closed interval, so we can't use the closed interval method, right? Because the domain, it, it goes from zero to infinity. One of the endpoints is infinity. And so, again, in the previous video, I, I talk about how to approach any kind of domain, not just closed intervals. But the idea is, what you're going to do is, you're going to find the limit as R approaches in the, each of the endpoints. So infinity of the function, note what that is. The limit as R approaches zero from the right, note what that is. And then you're going to find the all the critical numbers with respect to the first derivative. And then you're just going to analyze those critical numbers in, in, in also as they for what they are and also in comparison to the endpoint behavior. And you're just going to use logic to figure out what the absolute max or min is. Here would be the min. There's no, there's no hard rules that I can, like hard mathematical rules. Like I'm not telling you to find the, you find the endpoint behavior, then find the critical numbers, evaluate the function of the critical numbers, and then compare the values. There's no, there's no official math defined method for that, that we've come across yet for analyzing for maximum, absolute maximums and minimums over non-closed intervals. But that what I talked about in the previous video is it's, it's a good, it, it's good for non-math majors. It's, it's good enough to analyze what you need to analyze to get the answer you need. And, and you'll see, you, you'll, you'll see, I'll go, we'll go through examples of this in the example problem videos coming up in the next video. But again, you're going to analyze the endpoint behavior, find the critical numbers, and then just analyze the critical numbers like we did in curve sketching. You know, you take the limits of the critical number of, as X approaches the critical numbers from the left and the right of the function. And, and that way you can see, okay, is that critical number a, is it, is it, a, is it continuous there? Is it a discontinuity? And then, or is it a vertical asymptote? And so you'll just analyze it that way, get a sense for what it is, evaluate the function at that point if it's defined there, and then compare that to the endpoints. And you can use logic to see, okay, to figure out what the absolute min or max is. Okay, here's the function here, this a sub r. So as x approaches zero from the right, it goes to infinity. As x approaches zero from the left, it goes, or no, as x approaches infinity, it goes to infinity. There's one critical number, and so they use, they actually do give a math definition here that we're about to learn to conclude that, you know, by stamped math approval, you can conclude that this is the absolute min. And the reason what they say is that since the function, the, the first derivative is negative for all points to the left of this critical number, there's only one critical number. The first derivative is negative for all points to the left. The first derivative is positive for all points to the right, for on the entire function to the right. So with that, you can say that this is that must be the absolute min. And so you could use that idea if you want. That, that's more of an official math theorem. All right, and so that's the logic it uses to determine what, what value of R corresponds to the, the, the smallest possible surface area. And once you have R, that would be this number, this R here. And once you have that R, you could, then that constrains the H. Once the R is set, the H is set. Okay. So it says the argument used in example two to justify the absolute minimum is a variant of the first derivative test, which applies only to local maximum or minimum values and is stated here for future reference. So yeah, it's a, it's a variant of the first derivative test. The argument that I just mentioned, as far as the first derivative being positive everywhere to the left of the critical point or, or in negative everywhere to the right or vice versa, you can conclude that then, then that, that point must be an absolute max or min. And it says that here. So suppose that C is a critical number, but it, this is of a continuous function. So the function has to be continuous, defined on an interval. But, you know, the interval could be we just saw it could be the interval was zero to infinity. That was the interval. So it can have an infinite endpoints. If F prime of X is greater than zero for all X less than the critical point, and F prime of X is less than zero for all X greater than the critical point, then FC, then, then the function evaluated at, at that critical point is the, is the absolute maximum value of the function over that interval. 
okay? And then vice versa here, okay? So this is just some logic you can use in addition to the closed interval method for if you want like official math approved ways of, a fi of you know, stamped approved ways of finding absolute maxes and mins over an interval. But again, in the previous video, I go into detail on how you can have any interval, any function with discontinuities, whatever, and you can still use your logic as an engineer or scientist or business or someone in business to make a very safe, educated statement about what the absolute max in min is. You can feel confident about it, even though it's, you know, by, you know, it's not, you couldn't publish it in a math paper The you know, you couldn't prove it in a, technically in a math paper. It's fine for, for, ap, for practical application purposes. All right. An alternative method for solving optimization problems is to use implicit differentiation. Let's look at example two again to illustrate the method. We work with the same equations. Okay, we're gonna the the, the problem we just solved. Now they, they want to solve it with implicit differentiation. So here's the function as a function of r and h, the surface area, and then here's the second equation. All right. So instead of eliminating h, they differentiate both equations implicitly with respect to r. So they do this: d d r of the entire equation d d r okay so with that they get these two equations all right the minimum occurs at a critical number so we set a prime is equal to zero simplify and arrive at the equations well okay so the one thing i noticed though here is that they're making the assumption that the minimum occurs at a critical number what if the minimum occurred at one of the endpoints so I, you're assuming that the the endpoints is not where the critical number is, or not the critical number, where the endpoints is not where the absolute max or min is. Because we know that could be the case, like the, the, the closed interval method, the endpoints are potential absolute maxes and mins. So I, I guess you would, what, what you would do here is you would, you would take the, the limit of the function going to the endpoints, note that off to the side, and then use implicit differentiation to solve for the critical values and so you solve for the critical values because you know at a critical value a prime is equal to zero because that you know the function is continuous that's another thing too it, it, the you, the function is continuous at least in the region you're analyzing so a prime is equal to zero with that you can solve the equations and get h is equal to 2r there you go all right example three find the point on the parabola y squared is equal to 2x that is closest to the point one four all right, so here's the sideways parabola, y squared is equal to 2x. Here's the point 1, 4. What point on the parabola is closest to 1, 4, to this point? All right, so what's the variable to be optimized here? It's going to be this distance. You know, this x, y could be anywhere. x, y could be, x, y, the, the point could be here. Right, this is D. That distance. It's that D that's being optimized. Well, okay, so th that D is the variable to be optimized. Okay, I can put that in here. Okay, now here's a diagram with other, with, with, the, with the parabola. So how do you relate, how do we relate D to a point on this parabola? A, a point X, Y. Well, with the distance formula. So with the distance formula, the distance between this point and the point x, y, you get this here. So there's a formula that's relating the variable to be optimized, d, to other variables. Okay? Now, we need to express d as a function of a single variable. And, and we can do that because this point x, y, it could be anywhere. I, I, you, we, we put the distance between 1, 4 and x, y, but x, y could have been here. We, we have no clue x, y is, could be anywhere. And so the way we can relate X and Y is because we're going to constrain this point X, Y to be on this parabola. It's going to be constrained by this Y squared is equal to 2X. So with X is equal to 1 half Y, now you can express D as a function of just Y. All right. And then a trick they use here is, so this is, this is perfectly fine. You could go from here and, and find the absolute max. It would be the absolute minimum value of D and you put the, the, the domain, well, okay, yeah, what, what would the domain be? The domain would be, well, Y can be anything, right? Technically, Y can be any, the, the, the parabola can, this sideways parabola, Y can be anything. 
So the domain here is why is anything. Okay. Okay, but a, a trick that, so you, this is fine. You could find the absolute minimum value of D over all real numbers. But the, a trick they use to make it easier is, is instead we analyze that we find the minimum value of D squared, right? So instead we're going to, if we find the minimum value of D squared, then that, that, that value of Y is going to be the same as D. It's going to be the same as the minimum value of D. And so it says you should convince yourself that the minimum of D occurs at the same point as the minimum of d squared, but d squared is easier to work with. All right, there are no restrictions on y, so the domain is all real numbers. Okay, so again, you coming back here. This is this is the the function d squared, and as a function of a single variable, we want to find what is the minimum value of d squared over all real numbers here. So the idea is you're going to take the limit as y approaches the endpoints, so as y approaches negative infinity of d squared, as y approaches positive infinity of d squared, note what that is, then find critical points with respect to the first derivative, okay? That's what they do here, and so there's only one critical point, f prime of y is equal to zero and y is equal to two, and they actually use that first derivative test for the, 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 the theorem we just learned here, that applies since f prime of y is less than zero for all y less than two, and greater than zero for all y greater than two, you could you could you 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 could state that f prime of y is or no, that y is equal to two is the global minimum. All right, but even if you know even if you had multiple critical numbers, whatever, you could still again use logic. You don't even if you couldn't use this first derivative test, you could still use logic to figure out what the extreme value is. And we'll do example problems in the in the next video. All right, so they find. The, the point is y is equal to 2, which is plugging in that into the parabola, the equation for the parabola, it's, the point is 2 comma 2. All right, example 4. A man launches his boat from point A on a bank of a straight river, 3 kilometers wide, and wants to reach point B, 8 kilometers downstream on the opposite bank, as quickly as possible. He could row his boat directly across the river to point C and then run to B, or he could row directly to B, or he could row to some point D between C and B and then run to B. If he can row at 6 kilometers per hour and run at 8 kilometers per hour, where should he land to reach B as soon as possible? We assume that the speed of the water is negligible compared with the speed at which the man rows. Okay, so the current is negligible. All right, so he wants to get, he's starting at A, and he wants to get to B as fast as possible. He rows a certain speed, and he runs a certain speed. So should he just go straight across and then run 8 kilometers? Should he just row straight to B? Or should he go some intermediate distance, All right? So you, you and, and we know the, the river is three kilometers wide, and so they draw the diagram here. And so what's trying to be minimized? What are we trying to minimize here? We're trying to minimize the time, the time, the time it takes to get from A to B. So that's, you can't really see time in the diagram, but we know that, so the, the diagram shows that here X can be anything from zero to eight. If X is zero, the man doesn't technically he doesn't row he just goes straight across well he rows three he rows the minimum distance and then runs if x is eight he just goes he rows just doesn't run at all so so the value of x will tell us everything we need about the the decision the fastest the fastest decision how much to row and how much to run okay and so you they what they do is we, the the problem tells us that point C is point B is eight kilometers downstream from him, okay, and the river is three kilometers wide, and so we can use trigonometry to relate the the, the to to, okay, to say okay, so the man's going to row AD, okay, that's the general amount he's going to row. AD could be equal to three if x is equal to zero, but in general he's going to row AD. How 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 far is AD? AD is, it's the square root of 3 squared plus x squared, right? That's the length he rows. Again, x could be equal to 0, and he only rows 3 kilometers. x could be equal to 8, and he rows the, all the way to b, all right? Now, that distance, you, you, time is equal to distance divided by rate. So with that distance and the rate that he rows, you can get a time that he rows. The rowing time is this, x, the square root of x squared plus 9 divided by 6, 
All right. Now, the amount he runs is going to be, the, the distance is going to be 8 minus x, and then you could convert that into a time with the time, the, his speed of running, 8 minus x divided by 8. So the total time as a function of, and we'll just have this single variable x, is just add those two up. And so there's the function. The function to be optimized is a function of a single variable. All right, but what about the domain? Well, x is not going to be negative, and x is not going to be greater than 8. So x is going to be between 0 and 8, in, in, including the endpoint. So it's a closed interval. This should be a continuous function, yeah, and a closed interval. So this is easy to, to just use the closed interval method to find the optimum value of t, right? You've got the function. You've got the corresponding domain. Find the minimum value of the function over the domain, the shortest possible time, and that's going to be at x is equal to 9 over root 7. Okay. Example 5. Find the area of the largest rectangle that, that can be inscribed in a semicircle of radius r. Okay, so the largest rectangle that can be inscribed in a, in a semicircle of radius r. So the largest in terms of area. So the, the variable to be optimized is the area. Okay, now what is the area of the rectangle? They, they, they draw the diagram here with the, the center of the, the semicircle at the origin. So with that, the area of the rectangle is 2x times y. So there's the variable to be optimized as a function of the input, the other input variables in the diagram. But now we need to relate the, these, these input variables. How can we do that? Well, with the formula of the circle, right? It's inscribed so that you, 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 this 2x and the y are going to be related by, the, by what? The formula for this first circle, x squared plus y squared is equal to r squared. Solve for y or x. They solve for y. Plug that in. Now you've got the area as a function of a single input variable. There's r here, but r is constant. It's like a part of the solution. r is not a variable, okay? So you have the area as a function of a single input variable, but okay, but you're not done yet. What about the domain? Well, x is going to be what? x is going to go from 0 to here. That's 0 to r. You're either going to have a, the, 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 that's going to be the whole range of the rectangle. x is going to go from, well, no, y would go, no, okay, I'm sorry. So we're going left to right. So x would go from, yeah, 0 to r, right? You could have x be r, and then you just got, you have the area of the rectangle is 0, or it could be something less than r all the way to x is equal to 0, where the area is 0 again, okay? So x is between 0 and r. So look, it's a closed interval. This should be a continuous, yeah, this is a continuous function, at least in the region we're analyzing, because we're not in the negative, we're not going to have a negative root. So this is a closed interval, the closed interval method, continuous function of our closed interval. And so you evaluate at the endpoints, the endpoints, is the area is going to be equal to zero at the endpoints, right? So you just find the critical numbers and compare the critical numbers, and they do that. And they, it's at r over root 2. The radius divided by root 2, that's going to be the optimum point or the, 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 where the area is the largest. And the area is going to be equal to, at that point, r squared, right? It says a simpler solution is possible if we think of using an angle as a variable. Let theta be the angle as shown in figure 10. Then the area of the rectangle is, so the area as a function of theta is what? So they're just changing coordinate systems here. R cosine theta, R sine theta, right? 2R cosine theta times R sine theta. So it, it, what they're doing here is a, it's a polar coordinate system is what they're doing, right? So you, it's R theta. That's a polar coordinate system, R theta. So you've got radius R is constant, and then you're at some angle theta. And, and that's that and so you see like this point was x y right well this this is the point r theta and that's how you draw your rectangle you see and so it's instead of 2x times y it's 2 r cosine theta times r sine theta is the area as a function of just theta all right we know that sine of 2 theta has a maximum value of 1 and it occurs when 2 theta is equal to pi over 2 
So A of theta has a maximum value of R squared and occurs when theta is equal to pi over 4. Right? So they're just, they're finding the, theta is going to go from here. So theta would go, here's A of theta. And then the domain is theta goes from 0 to pi. So now they just find what's the maximum value of R squared sine of 2 theta over this interval. Okay, applications to business and economics. In section 3.7, we introduce the idea of marginal cost. Recall that if C of X, the cost function, is the cost of producing X units of a certain product, then the marginal cost is the rate of change of C with respect to X. In other words, the marginal cost function is the derivative C prime of X of the cost function. So... Yeah, the, the, you know, don't get too bogged down with this because, you know, it, it, you can feel like you don't understand calculus because you don't understand this business jargon they're talking about. And so, you know, I don't like when they go into, into too much detail on certain on topics that are non-math topics. But the, the cost function is that you, you're going to manufacture a certain amount of items. Like you have a manufacturing plan. So you're gonna manu if you're going to manufacture 100 cans of Coke, 1,000 cans of Coke, whatever, What's the cost to manufacture 1,000 cans of Coke, 5,000 cans of Coke? That's what X is, the, the amount you're going to manufacture. And, and, and C is the cost to manufacture those, X units of a certain product. The, the marginal cost is just the derivative of this with respect to X, okay? All right, now let's consider marketing. Let P of X be the price per unit that the company can charge if it sells X units, so like the price for a can of Coke. Then P is called the demand function or the price function. Yeah, so uh, this is like business stuff, but the idea is like if you put the price to like high, like, like for a certain number of units, 100 units, 1,000 units, you can't put the price too high or you won't be able to sell all those units. You put the price really low where well, you can sell them all, but like the idea is what's that, that sweet spot where, you know, that maximum price where you can sell, just sell all, if X is 100, that maximum price where you can just sell all 100 units. And if you went just above that price, then you'd sell 99 units, right? That's, that's the price function. And they call it a demand function in that sense, okay? And, okay, we would expect it to be a decreasing function of X, yeah. If you want to sell, if you want to sell more cans, you're going to have to lower the price. If you want to sell 5 million cans of Coke, then you, then you, you want to make sure you sell them all, you have, the price can't be too high. If X units are, are sold and the price per unit is P sub X, then the total revenue is... Yeah, quantity times price, X times P of X, okay? That's the revenue function. The number of units sold times P sub X. And the X is also the number of units manufactured, right? You kind of assume in this perfect world where the number of units you manufacture, you also sell. Okay, R is called the revenue function. The derivative R prime of the revenue function is called the marginal revenue function and is the rate of change of revenue with respect to the number of units sold. The rate of change of revenue with respect to the number of units sold. That's some business talk there. If X units are sold, then the total profit is the revenue minus the cost, right? And P is called the profit function. Then there's the marginal profit function is P prime, all right? And so with that information, they, we, they give an example here. So a store has been selling 200 flat screen TVs a week at $350, $350 each. A market survey indicates that for each $10 rebate offered to buyers, the number of TVs sold will increase by 20 a week. Find the demand function and the revenue function. How large a rebate should the store offer to maximize its revenue? So, you know, this is this is going to wear you out because now you got to think about this, you know, it's more than calculus here. You got to turn on you. You got to really, you know, got to have a business brain here. But let's just try and look at this and so you can just get a sense for optimization problems. All right. So... Let's see. It says if X is the number of TVs sold per week, then the weekly increase in sales is X minus 200. All right. X is the number of TVs sold per week, then the weekly increase in sales is X minus 200. So if you only sell 100 units, then you've de the, the, in the quote unquote increase is actually a decrease. So it's kind of a deceiving sentence here. It's like it's, it's saying increase like this should always be an increase, but it's technically... It, it, X could be any number, zero to whatever, or any number greater than or equal to zero. It could, this could be a decrease in sales or an increase, depending on what X is, all right? For each increase of 20 units sold, all right, the price is decreased by $10, all right? So 
So, so for each additional unit sold, the decrease in price will be 120th times 10 of the demand function is, so P sub X, what are they saying here? Okay, so the, if a $10 rebate is offered to buyers, the number of TVs sold will increase by 20 a week. So if you, that what they're saying here is, don't worry about the rebate, just if the idea is if you decrease the price by $10, the sales increase by 20, 20 a week, all right? Or that they say the other way around, for each increase of 20 units sold, the price is decreased by $10. So for each additional unit sold, the price is decreased by 10 divided by 20, right? It's, it's, uh, it's 50 cents. For each additional unit sold over 200, the price decreases by 50 cents. And the demand function is, so yeah, the X minus 200, the amount of units over more than 200, additional units sold, then you can decrease the price for 50 by 50 cents for each one of those unit one of those units so the original price is 350 so i guess x they're assuming x is always greater than 200 i i don't i don't know i guess it doesn't have to be because if it's less than x is less than 200 then you'll increase the price okay so you see what they're saying here the the, the store has been selling 200 flat screen TVs a week at $350 each but then they give us this way that you can relate the units sold to the price which is demand so if they sell more than 200 units in a week, and so and then based on this this rebate data here, if they're going to sell more than 200 units, then they, if they want to sell more than 200 units, then they they're going to decrease the price by 50 cents per unit. That's more than 200 units. But if it's less than 200, if they sell only 150 units, then you're going to increase the price. And so there's the profit or the the, the profit function, the demand no the the price function, the demand function. All right, and then, then they here's the revenue function x piece of x, and then they get the r prime of x, okay, and so r prime of x they solve for the absolute maximum value of r prime of x. I guess when x is greater than or equal to zero, that's the domain, and then that's when the revenue function is max when x is equal to 450. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, that's a lot of business jargon, but uh, you get the idea of. You know, you could have some function for a for something in science, business, engineering, and you want to. It, it makes sense. You want to maximize the revenue, maximize profit, etc. Okay, let's now work some example problems.